I've started playing so many games recently that I honestly don't recall how I was first introduced to Ion Fury and when I bought it. What I do know is that someone on Discord told me that it was worth looking into, and the fact that it's what some refer to as a boomer shooter is what drew me in. Despite being a 90s kid, I really wasn't aware of the FPS gaming scene on PC back then. It's not only because I was too young to play some of these games when they were initially released, but also because my family got its first PC around 1999. Despite that, there are still crystal clear memories and images in my mind's eye of me either attempting to play games like Blood or seeing Doom played. I guess it's something about how your brain absorbs information when you're that young that the games just appeal to me that much, or it's a bit of both and then some. What I do know is that something about boomer shooters just really clicks with me. I don't want to say that they're mindless games that I can zone out to while I play, mainly because I'd make it sound as if they lack substance, and that's not true. If I had to whittle it down to the simplest reason as to why I'm drawn into these games, it's because the concept is simple. Run and gun down X kind of enemies either from sci-fi, fantasy, or some other genre out there. It's a simple concept, but there's a lot that can be done with it. So that's one reason why there are as many of these games as there are and why they're as appreciated as they are. I'm sure that in the wide genre of these games there are some real stinkers, but the truth is that the classics are as revered as they are for a reason. If I knew more about the devs involved in making this game, I might be able to explain why it having been made was such a big deal, but the truth is that I can't. What I do know is that after having played Ion Fury, I can confidently say that this is a game worth playing if you're heavily into FPS shooters such as Doom 1, 2, or Blood. You don't even have to go that far back in order to enjoy these games because over the last 5 years or so, there's been a resurgence of them, so you really don't have to go out of your way to give them a try. Being that this is an FPS game, it makes sense that the combat would be a huge part of it. Unfortunately, when I first started playing Eye on Fury, I was close to moving on from it. It's because the gunplay felt very stiff. It felt like I had to struggle to get the guns to move around in the way that I wanted them to. The movement wasn't as fluid as I would have liked or how it feels in other games. I could have moved on from Ion Fury, but the fact it had so much working for it and that someone spoke highly of it made me want to keep giving it a chance. Even if FPS games tend to have at least one or a handful of things that are similar between them, one thing that stands out to me is how many weapons can be used and what kind of weapons they are. In the beginning, the shotgun was my favorite weapon. It's not only because a lot of attention goes into making shotguns in FPS games stand out, something I like to believe started thanks to Doom 1 and 2, but I'm sure that's arguable. What surprised me about the shotgun was how effective it was at long range. I'm sure that some would be bothered by that, seeing as how shotguns are meant to be affected at short or mid range, at least depending on the model it is, but in Ion Fury it was too easy to rely on it for just about every kind of combat situation. Alongside the combat, I thought that the crossbow was very effective. The fact that this is a cyberpunk styled game would make it seem that a crossbow seems out of place or that it'd be ineffective, but that wasn't the case here. I guess it also helps that the arrows weren't typical. It's not as if you could use the crossbow as if it were an automatic weapon, but on the bright side, being precise with it paid off. What I liked about Iron Fury is that each weapon offered its pros and cons, so it's easy to say that they were well balanced. It wasn't like in other FPS games where you can more or less go through the entire game relying on just one weapon alone. As I was first starting to get accustomed to using the grenade launcher, I wasn't sure how to use it to its fullest extent. As a result of that, I was initially left thinking that it would have been great if the grenade rounds exploded on impact. It was eventually nice to learn that the grenade rounds do in fact explode on impact, at least when they're shot directly at an enemy. At the same time, I didn't like that the grenade would bounce around if you wouldn't directly shoot at an enemy or hittable object. I'm sure that this option was available because it could be used in a specific manner, but I didn't like this because the bouncing grenades could sometimes damage you. In the end, I guess more options are better than fewer, even if in this case one of the options can harm you. I paid a lot of attention to the grenade launcher because of how responsive it was and how it could be used in more ways than one. I'm not entirely sure if this is true or not, mainly because this only happened once, but I did notice, even if only momentarily, that you could shoot grenades back at enemies. This happened when I least expected it, and I wasn't able to do it again at a later time, so I'm not as confident about this as I should slash could be. I will however say that if this can be done on a regular basis, that's awesome. Simply put, I love the grenade launcher. If you were to write a list of what makes a great FPS game, sound design would be listed there. I'm sure that I've mentioned this before in past reviews, but great sound design can be the difference between a weapon feeling good or bad. It's an oversimplification to say that the guns in Ion Fury sound great. Some specific examples that led me to this conclusion are the following. I loved how crunchy the headshots sounded. It's probably a minor detail to some, but getting this right isn't as simple as some would think. 
kind of how people will never notice when a person is doing their job well and can only tell when they're either doing a bad job or an essential part is missing. Besides the great sounding headshots, I thought it was amazing when one explosive would take out multiple enemies. Whether it was a grenade or an explosive barrel, the result was awesome. It also helped that there was a visual aspect to this. On top of the graphic mess that was left, the squishy noise helped add to that. I wish I could say that each weapon was as enjoyable to use as the shotgun or the grenade launcher, but then I'd be lying. It's possible that I just wasn't as familiar with the dual machine guns as I should have been, but I had no idea why they'd end up transporting you to different places. One minute I could be using them to gun down an enemy, and the next I'd be transported a few feet ahead of me. I don't know if it was a bug, or if it was meant to be that way. Either way, I thought it was cumbersome to deal with. That's one of the reasons why I was happy when I eventually realized that you didn't have to dual wield the machine gun. I was around 15 hours into the game, but the saying, better late than never comes to mind. After this point, I started to rely on the machine gun more than I previously did, and I eventually realized that I made the right choice. It's because I enjoyed the flame effect of the machine gun. As a result of that, you could save ammo by how much damage the bullets and the fire effect would dish out. One thing I've noticed about myself is that I'm not always completely aware of how much a game has to offer, at least when it comes to its mechanics and other available controls slash options. In the eyes of some, that's probably not a good thing, but I like to think that being able to beat a game without utilizing all it has to offer says more about my skills by making do with a little. I bring this up because it took me way too long to realize that you actually had to turn on the power boosts that you'd occasionally find scattered around levels. Initially, I assumed that picking them up was enough, but I was wrong. It's possible that some areas of the game, or maybe even the overall game would have been easier to deal with had I known this sooner rather than later, but seeing as how I was able to beat the game without rage quitting, I'd say I was able to manage. The overall art direction of Ion Fury is cyberpunk. It also helps that this spills over into its OST. At times, its music reminded me of the hacker's OST. As I previously said in other reviews, I enjoyed the OST to the point where I'd happily listen to it outside of playing Ion Fury. What's also worth mentioning is that the OST was varied. It wasn't just one style of electronic music, so even if you're not into that style, there's surely something in here that would appeal to you. Something that stood out to me about the game's music was how it was occasionally used for the purpose of humor. That could be seen in different areas of the game, but sometimes you had to go out of your way to look for humorous moments. What I liked about the combination of music and humor was how Muzak started to play after you hit the self-destruct button towards the end of the game. I found that funny because you usually expect something like a repetitive and blaring announcement, much like in the classic Resident Evil games, but that wasn't the case in Ion Fury. This is really more about how I experience the music, but seeing as how I tend to game during late hours of the night, I can't fully enjoy a game's sound as much as I would like. That straight up sucks because I have studio monitors that could probably lead to having the cops call on me if I were to blast them at their max volume. Seeing as how I didn't want that to happen, but I still wanted to clearly hear what the music had to offer, I still decided to crank up the sound during reasonable hours. Doing this more often probably would have led to me noticing more of the game's sound design and music, but for the brief amount of time that I did this, I was happy with what I got to experience. At this point, I feel as if I'm repeating myself by writing about what FPS veterans know what to expect from an FPS, but I also wouldn't be doing a good job if I wasn't mentioning what stood out to me and why. I probably shouldn't have been surprised by this, but it was still impressive to see just how huge the levels in Ion Fury were. Even when I was just starting to play, I expected some degree of backtracking, seeing as how colored keys were involved, but overall, it was taken to a level that I really didn't expect. At one point, it left me asking myself how many zones does this game have? I thought that was weird because other games have gotten me used to the idea that there simply aren't levels, or there are levels that offer uniformity to their overall length. I guess that's a long-winded way of saying that the varied length of the levels in Ion Fury left me thinking that their pace was a bit off. In particular, there was one level, Tunnel Disturbance, which featured a lot of backtracking. I didn't think that was bad at all. What made this interesting to me was that there were multiple different layers to it. Design-wise, Tunnel Disturbance was probably the most interesting level that Ion Fury had to offer. It's because it required more thought besides just running and gunning while continuing to move forward. It also helped that it featured a lot of different hidden areas and paths that could be used both offensively and defensively. That last part especially stood out to me in this kind of game because you generally expect something like that in a game more like Deus Ex or System Shock 2. I always bring up how the more options a game has the better, but sometimes a feature like that feels a bit out of place, even if it's sometimes useful. In continuing to discuss some of these massive levels, at times I felt that it was too easy to go off in any direction and forget about where you were coming from. I'm sure that the devs had this in mind, seeing as how you could bring up a map to help orient yourself, but sometimes it really didn't help as much as you would have liked. 
In my case, it was more about being aware of specific looking areas and landmarks to help distinguish where I've been versus what was new to me. Sometimes it wasn't that easy and I'd be left with no idea where to go. That's one of the reasons why it took me as long as it did to get through Eye on Fury. The fact that I had fun with this game says it all, but sometimes I don't want to spend more time than is necessary with a game. That's especially true when occasional play sessions weren't as long as I would have liked, so I'd end up dedicating a great chunk of time going backwards and forwards hoping to find the right way. Though that was annoying to deal with, I thought it was funny how sometimes I'd stumble into the right thing to do. In contrast to that, there were moments where I could easily go through Ion Fury without having to struggle. To some that might sound weird, wanting to avoid too much of a challenge in a game, but what I'm referring to is that once you're on a roll it's easy to keep going. As I was sometimes able to breeze through levels, it was occasionally hard to take everything in while blasting everything in sight. I bring that up because it reminded me of how easy it is to get through manga chapters. Who knows how long it takes a mangaka to finish a chapter only for you to read through it in 5-10 to 10 minutes. It's possible that may bother some devs, but seeing as how speedrunning has been a thing for quite some time, I'm sure that the bottom line is that they're happy that their game is being played. As I mentioned earlier in this review, the initial difficulty I had with gunplay nearly turned me off from Eye on Fury. This actually continued later on in the game, but it wasn't as startling. What I noticed is that hit detection was a bit off whenever I'd aim at enemies that were on a lower plane than I was. It wasn't a big deal, but I think that had to do with the nature of the 90s styled FPS games. If I knew more about the engine used, I could go in depth in regards to the pros, cons, and limits of it, but since I don't, I can only bring up my first hand experience. This started to become more apparent during levels that had more verticality to them. It made things harder than they needed to be and it was as if the game, or most likely the engine, wanted you to keep your aiming at a certain level. It was frustrating because there were moments where I had to fight against that to aim at enemies below me. I could have just gone up close and personal to them, but seeing as how I didn't want to just rush in and end up dying, I did what I felt was necessary. I like to think of myself as an FPS veteran, so you'd think that'd mean that any FPS game for me would be a cakewalk, but that wasn't the case with Ion Fury. At times I was seriously running out of ammo and I felt incentivized to seek out the hidden areas that usually had ammo drops. At times this sense of difficulty also spilled over to some boss fights. In particular, it took me way too long to realize how to damage the final boss. Even when I did figure it out, there was a lot to deal with in that fight, so it took much longer than I would have liked to get through it. On the bright side, that battle arena reminded me of when the lab in Half-Life 1 is blowing up and you have to jump into the portal to Zen. Though I definitely enjoyed Ion Fury, I eventually got to the point where I wanted to beat it and move on. That's happened more than once and I'd say that there are multiple different reasons as to why that happens. With Ion Fury, it's because I felt that it was longer than it needed to be and at times it kept dragging on. The average time to beat it is around 10 hours, but it took me around 22 hours to finish. I'm sure that mainly had to do with occasional moments of getting lost and difficulty, but my point still stands that the game felt as if it were longer than it needed to be. I enjoyed Ion Fury, but the truth is that I was playing another game, Garlic, at the same time, and there were moments where I preferred dedicating more time to it. It's possible that I'll eventually review Garlic and discuss in depth why I greatly enjoyed it, but if I had to mention one reason why that was, it's because it offered something different through its gameplay and humor. I'm sure that some may be wondering why I bring this up, but it's because despite agreeing that I enjoyed this game and recommend it, I wasn't left thinking that it was amazing and must be experienced by all. One thought I was left with towards the end of my time with Ion Fury is that rather than seeking out classic and modern boomer shooters, I'd probably be better off getting into Doom wads. It's not only because they'd offer an experience that I'm more familiar with and know that I'd enjoy from the get-go, but also because I've heard of some that are spoken highly of. If you enjoyed this content, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Thank you very much for watching.